Welcome, friends, to our Easter Day service. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Grace and peace to you from God, who is and who was and who is to come, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Amen. Our opening hymn, See What a Morning. he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. As we come before him now, let us confess our sins. O Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we bow before you in sorrow for our sins, and we confess to you our weakness and our unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. So Lord, in your mercy, forgive us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. Lord, in your mercy, please forgive us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, please, Lord, forgive us. Lift our minds above earthly things. Set them in things in heaven. Show us your glory and your power that we may serve you gladly all our days. 
In Jesus' name, amen. O Lord, open our lips and our mouths will proclaim your praise. O Lord, we want to worship the risen Jesus. We want to bring praise and glory to his name. So we say glory to the Father and to the risen Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. We're going to have our first scripture reading now. The first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, and beginning at the first verse, the Passover. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in Egypt. This month is to be the first month of the year for you. Give these instructions to the whole community of Israel. On the 10th day of the month, each man must choose either a lamb or a young goat for his household. If his family is too small to eat one whole animal, he and his next door neighbor may share an animal in proportion to the number of people and the amount that each person can eat. You may choose either a sheep or a goat, but it must be a one-year-old male without any defects. Then on the evening of the 14th day of the month, the whole community of Israel will kill the animals. The people are to take some of the blood and put it on their doorposts above the doors of the houses in which the animals are to be eaten. That night, the meat is to be roasted and eaten with bitter herbs and with bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled, but eat it roast whole, including the head and the legs and the internal organs. You must not have any of it until morning. If any is left over, it must be burned. You are to eat it quickly, and you are to be dressed for travel, and you're sal with sandals on your feet and your stick in your hand. It is the Passover festival to honour me, the Lord. On that night, I will go through the land of Egypt, killing every firstborn male, both human and animal, and punishing all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood on your doorposts will be a sign to mark the houses in which you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and will not harm you when I punish the Egyptians. You must celebrate this day as a religious festival to remind you of what I, the Lord, have done. Celebrate it for all time to come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now our second hymn this morning, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
Okay, good morning, boys and girls. This is strange times that we're finding ourselves in. And let me say, I'm really missing being with you. But I've got an opportunity today to do something which might seem a bit strange. We are going to bake a cake. Now, I was doing this earlier in the week for a birthday cake for my youngest son. And I started to think, there are things I can learn from baking a cake. You're finding yourself in a strange situation today. No school. Can't go out, except for a short walk. Can't have your friends around to play. Can't go to your caravan. Can't go on a foreign holiday. Even going to the shops is very different. Life has changed for us all. There are good things that happen in life and there are bad things that happen in life. There are things that we like and enjoy and there are things that are not pleasant at all. And as I was baking this cake, I started to think the ingredients that we put in at the start, they don't seem that pleasant. I'm using a ready-made cake mix. What is it? It's a lot of dusty powder. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to eat that. But that's not the only thing we put into it. The recipe I'm using says to add water. Water's fine on its own, but that's not enough for this cake. It says I have to add cooking oil. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not fond of taking cooking oil on its own. But we'll follow the instructions. And it's not just a little dash of cooking oil. It's a glug, 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 glug. A lot of cooking oil. Where does it go? Into the cake mix. And already my cake mix is looking a bit, hmm, do I really want to eat that? But we're not finished there either. We have eggs. Not cooked eggs, but raw eggs. Not just one egg. Not just two eggs. But three eggs. And if I thought the, the, the mix and the water and the oil looked a bit unpleasant, well, the eggs haven't done a lot for it. Will I leave it there or will it go on? It says now you have to mix thoroughly for three minutes to get all the lumps, all the ingredients worked together. And we can see that starting to happen now. And I was thinking a bit about life as I was baking this cake. And I was thinking, first of all, the ingredients are measured. There's certain amounts. It's not just, oh, I'll throw a handful of this and I'll throw a wee pinch of that and a wee bit of the other and hopefully it'll come out okay. No, there were measured amounts. They were exact amounts. And that made me think that there was a plan. There was a design behind all these ingredients coming together. Somebody knew that if the instructions were followed, all the unpleasantness, all the things that I didn't like on their own, when they were mixed together through time, it would work out just fine. And do you know that's very comforting to realize as Christians, 
that God is in control. Even through these strange times, these difficult times, these uncertain times, God is still in control. And although we haven't got to the end, and I'm just going to show you how the cake looks at the moment, it's like a mud pie, except there's no bits of grass, and there's no stones, and there's no bits of this, that, and the other. But it still doesn't look very appetizing. And I wouldn't eat any of it. But it looks different. And as I was stirring the cake up, I was thinking about all those ingredients. Sometimes your life just seems in a turmoil. Sometimes it seems as if it's just going round and round and round, and you have lost control. And you wonder, will it ever stop? And it has. And what do we do now? Well, my instructions say that now I have to pour it into a baking tin. But there's something special about this baking tin. It's already been greased. I put a little bit of butter over that. And that made me think that even before the cake was baked, that there was preparations been made for release. Why have I greased it? So whenever the cake is baked, and I turn it upside down, it'll come out of the tin. And it made me think that there was a plan also for the release of the cake. And this time that we're going through in our lives at the minute, as Christians, we believe that someday God will bring it to an end. And God is bringing together a lot of different ingredients, and he is going to make something very special and very good out of this. We don't see at the minute how it is going to work out. But we trust that God knows. And already, if we read in the papers or listen to the news, or we even see on a Thursday night when our communities and our, our neighbors come together at the front door to clap hands and applause and appreciation for the health services and all the workers that are keeping things going. That is one of the, the good things that God is doing that otherwise we just wouldn't have thought about at all. And that's just one thing. There are many good things happening, although all the individual ingredients on their own aren't nice. Now what I have to do, I have to put it into the tin. I'm not going to put it all in. Fill it up to a certain level. Maybe you've been doing this at home with your mums, maybe your dads, because apparently baking has become very popular again, and seals of flour have gone up. And there we go. One mud pie, but we're not finished yet. The instruction says, what do we have to do with it? What would you do with it? Put it in the fridge? Not that type of cake. This one goes in the oven. And there again, it goes in at a very special temperature. And it goes in for a certain length of time. Not just any old thing will do. And at a certain point in time, it comes out, because if it stays on too long, it's going to be burnt, and nobody wants a burnt cake. Now, fortunately, as in all good television programs, I have one prepared earlier, and this is what it looks like. Isn't that beautiful? But do you see something about those two cakes, the way they have changed? What has changed? One is flat, and the other has done what? It has risen up. Now, what made it rise up? And I thought that was very important too. In the oven, very quickly, things change from the flat mud pie, if you like, 
to one that starts to get domed and the heat has done its work. Everything is reacting, combining, swelling uh, and expanding. And suddenly we've got something that looks entirely different and altogether a lot more edible. Now the test is, after a certain time, it's not just enough to leave it in to the, to the time that it says in the packet. It says, bring it out, and if a broad-bladed knife goes into the cake, and I thought this was very important, if it comes out clean, it's ready. Think of the difference with this one. Knife goes in, and cake comes out. Not ready. Time hasn't done its work. Heat hasn't done its work. But this one has. And the final test is, will it come out of the tin? Well, let's see. If I had a drum roll, maybe you can do a drum roll for me at home, on the table or whatever, or, or you stamp your feet on the ground. Okay. And here we go. Please come out. Please come out. Yep, it has come out, <laughs> and I am very relieved, very relieved. One cake. Ready. In fact, I'm going to set it there. Because we're not just finished yet. The cake has risen up. It has done what the instructions would say it was going to do. But now we get the reward. And this is the bit that maybe you enjoy. Certainly the bit that I enjoy. And this is the bit that gave the rise to the expression. This is the icing on the cake. And I'm beginning to wish I hadn't stuck the knife into the uncooked cake. Because this is the finish. This is the reward. And it made me think as well that someday, as Christians, the icing will be on the cake, if you like, of our lives. Someday when we meet our Father in heaven, there will be rewards. And God will lavishly bless his children. And then we will perhaps understand better some of the times that we have been through. So what do we need to do in these times? We need to keep faithful. We need to realize that God is in control and that God will keep us. And I'm going a wee bit over heavy with the, the cocoa powder. That's all right. I want to just leave a wee message very briefly for you. And this is what is written in the New Testament book in Romans. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good. Remember the cake. But I want to, at this Easter time, I want you to remember one thing more. Jesus said something to his disciples. Jesus said at one point he began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed but on the third day, 
he would be raised from the dead. He would be killed. He would suffer many terrible things. Even the Lord Jesus Christ was not spared suffering, hardship, and horrors. He knew that he had to endure it, and he willingly did. But he also knew that his heavenly Father would bring him back to life again on the third day. And he tried to tell his disciples, but they couldn't understand. We understand now better on the other side of Easter. But they didn't know. But even Jesus had to go through the bad times, the times of testing, and the heat, if you like, of the oven. And he rose up victorious. God bless you this Easter time. May you have a good peaceful, safe one, and remember God's key. Amen.
Christ the champion of our faith. He has risen. He has risen. He has risen. Jesus is alive. second reading is from the Gospel according to St Luke, chapter 24, and beginning at the first verse. The Resurrection. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb carrying the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the entrance of the tomb, so they went in. But they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They stood puzzled about this when suddenly two men in bright shining clothes stood by them. Full of fear, the women bowed down to the ground, and the men said to them, Why are you looking among the dead for the one who is alive? He is not here. He has been raised. Remember what he said to you while you were in Galilee. The Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men, be crucified, and three days later rise to life. Then the woman remembered his words. They returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven disciples and all the rest. The women were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James. They and the other women with them told these things to the apostles. But the apostles thought that what the woman had said was nonsense. They did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. He bent down and saw the linen wrapping, but nothing else. Then he went back home amazed at what had happened. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Over the history of humankind, as recorded in the Bible, God has attempted on many occasions to get his people to sit up and take notice, to take notice of him, to take notice of his ways, to take notice of his laws, and to take notice of his word. For example, the story of Noah and the great flood. Beforehand, God had declared his displeasure with humanity, with the wickedness of people, the people whom he had created. I'm sure he would have given many warnings, asking people to take notice, but no one did. The warnings were largely ignored. God soon got the attention of the world, however, and the flood came. Abraham, he also pleaded with God to save Sodom and Gomorrah, hoping that he would even find 10 people who were righteous so that God might relent and may find some other way of dealing with his people. However, as we know, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Something I'm sure that made the whole world sit up and take notice. In Scripture, we also read of how very often the people of Israel became obedient to God. And God, as a result, sent various prophets to point out the error of the people. The people had turned away from God, and instead they'd chosen to look to other gods. They worshipped idols. They disobeyed God's laws. However, the pleas of the prophets were largely ignored. 
But God sent many, many warnings. Nevertheless, he wanted people to take notice of him and his ways. But they didn't. They were warned about the imminent doom to come. Individuals, kings, and the people in general refused to take notice. Among some of the best known take notice stories in the Old Testament is the story of the Passover, the story we read earlier. You'll remember how the Hebrew nation, the children of Israel, had been enslaved by the Egyptians. You'll remember how powerful their masters were. They, the Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians for 400 years. You'll recall how God provided them with a great leader in the shape of Moses. And Moses approached Pharaoh and asked him to set the Hebrew slaves free so that they could travel to the land that God had promised them and they could live there as his chosen people. But of course, Pharaoh refused initially. And God sent a series of plagues on Egypt to reveal his power. But even so, Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. Ten plagues in all came down upon the Egyptians. And among those plagues were plagues of flies, plagues of frogs, plagues of hail and locusts and darkness. All these and more came upon the Egyptians. Each one of these plagues came with a request from Moses to Pharaoh to let his people go. The plagues were to me take notice moments which brought constant refusal from Pharaoh and ultimately caused great suffering on the Egyptian people. These take notice events culminated in the final plague, the plague of the death of the firstborn, more commonly called the Passover. The enslaved Hebrews were told by Moses to paint the lintels and the doorposts of their homes and to stay home, to stay inside until the angel of death passed over. And as we know, those doorposts and those lintels had the blood of a lamb smeared on them so that the angel of death would not enter. Sadly, the angel of death did strike down the firstborn of every home without the lamb's blood. This surely was a take notice moment that had the effect of melting the heart of Pharaoh and he allowed the children of Israel to go free. God has been in business utilizing take notice moments right throughout scripture. Of course, two days ago now, we marked one other such take notice moment when we remembered the crucifixion of Jesus. That certainly was a take notice moment for all who witnessed it, especially for Jesus' disciples. But it's also for us a take notice moment. Take notice of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. Jesus fulfills the will of the Father. Jesus takes the punishment we deserve. The grace of God is literally poured out through the blood that was shed for us by Jesus. Forgiveness of sins was made available through the blood of the Lamb. This time, not a sacrificial lamb as at the Passover time, but the very Son of God sacrificed for you and for me. That's worth taking notice of. I'm sure you'll agree. 
However, what happened next on the first Easter day was the greatest take notice moment of all time. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Our second reading, we found Mary and her friends at the empty tomb. They perhaps initially think, as is recorded in John's gospel, my goodness, someone has stolen Jesus' body. That was what they saw. That was what they noticed. What Mary didn't notice initially were the two men dressed in gleaming white, two angels. And these angels reminded Mary and her companions of something that they had failed to notice just a few days earlier. The angel reminds them of what Jesus had said. Look at verse 6. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you? And I'm adding in, did you not take notice? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered. Jesus had risen from the grave. No one in the history of the world had ever returned from the grave in this way. This was something worth taking notice of. Mary and her companions did, and they quickly ran to tell the other disciples. But we're told that at that time, the other disciples didn't believe. They didn't believe what Mary was saying. It was only later when Jesus appeared to the group that they believed. And then, as a result of their testimony, many people began to take notice. And the church was established. The church was established eventually right across the whole world. Sadly, though, there are many in the world and many in our society who have failed to take notice. To take notice of the fact that Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Many have failed to take notice. There are those who will not take notice. What will it take for people to take notice of what God has done for us? Will it take a flood? Will it take the destruction of a couple of cities? Will it take a bunch of prophets coming along and prophesying doom if we don't take notice? Will it take a world war? Will it take a pandemic for us to take notice and declare that the living God is the creator, is the sustainer, is the provider, is the defender, is the righteous judge, and that he has provided us with a great redeemer in Jesus. Are we ready to take notice of what God expects from his people? Does God not want us to take notice of his word and apply it to our lives? Does God not want us to turn away from the ways of the world and instead to walk in his ways? Does God not want us to take notice like Mary and her companions did that Christ died on the cross to overcome sin, to wash us clean through his blood, and that he has defeated death and that he is alive, that he is risen indeed. And because of what he's done, he's given each of us the opportunity through faith to overcome sin and death. He's given us the opportunity to know the salvation for our souls. Easter Day reminds us of this great salvation that is available to us. So let's set up and take notice and be ready 
and willing to put our trust in the risen Lord Jesus today. Will you, from your heart and from your mouth, respond today? Christ is risen. I hope your response is, the Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. For he is our saviour. He is our living hope. Friends, we're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer now. I'm going to lead our prayers and then I'm going to ask Alan to continue in prayer with me. So let us pray. Sovereign God, we don't understand how you raised Jesus from the dead, how you breathed life into his broken body, how you rolled the stone away from the tomb, how he appeared unrecognized to Mary in the garden and to the disciples later on that road to Emmaus. We don't understand how he walked through locked doors to be with the apostles. We don't understand how he repeatedly appeared from nowhere to stand among his followers. But what we do understand is this, Lord, that he changed the lives of everyone that he met, turning their sorrow into celebration, their despair into hope, their doubt into faith, and that he is with us now through his life-giving spirit. He is remaking our lives bit by bit. He is giving us joy. He is giving us peace and a sense of purpose, such as we had never imagined possible before. We do not understand everything about what you do, Lord, but we believe, and therefore we rejoice, and we offer you our grateful worship in the name of Jesus, your Son, the risen Saviour. Living God, we praise you for the great truth of Easter, the message that your love will never be defeated. When human evil has done its worst, despite every effort to frustrate your purpose, still you will triumph. The stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. Christ had risen. May that truth fire each of us every day. May it fill us with new hope, new confidence and new enthusiasm, knowing that whatever obstacles we may face and whatever we may have to fight against, even COVID-19, that there is nothing that will finally be able to thwart your purposes or to deny your saving power. We give you thanks, Lord, today. And we remember those in our community who are suffering from ill health because of this virus. We thank you for the blessing of the many, many people who work in the NHS to give support to those who are ill. We're thankful for those who provide us with the food that we need to eat. We're thankful for everyone who in any way supports the effort against this COVID-19 and who supports others by providing what is needed at this time. Lord, may they all know your blessing. May they all know your protection. May they know your safety in their lives at this time. Watch over each one, we pray, in Jesus' precious name. And Lord, we also want to remember those who have been bereaved in recent times because of this virus, not just locally here, but also right across our nation and right across the world. Lord, please be with all who grieve. In the name of Jesus, amen. Heavenly Father, your word tells us for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, 
A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Lord, your word tells us, it goes on to say, what do people really get for all their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on us all. Yet God made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. And Father, that is so very true. And as we find ourselves in this worldwide pandemic, this very abnormal situation, it affects us all in ways that are similar and in ways that it can be very different according to our individual needs. Some people it hasn't affected their lives that greatly. Other people it has affected their lives tremendously. Lord, and we pray for maybe the people that are forgotten, the people that this time has caused greater hardship. Lord, we have remembered those who are on the caring services and they're really very much the front line of this pandemic. And they are really daily risking their lives going into work. And Lord, we have lauded them and we have applauded them and we thank you for them. And for those who are keeping services going, shop workers, delivery, transport, all those services. But Father, we think also of those for whom this time has become especially hard. For those whose services have been taken away, maybe care assistance has been reduced. Maybe support workers are not available. And people who are vulnerable are very much isolated and alone and really struggling. But we thank you, Father, that you have raised up people who have seen a need and who are seeking to do something rather than nothing. We pray, Lord, for those who are vulnerable in this situation. In situations, Lord, where the domestic situation at home never was good, and this hasn't made it better. Lord, we ask in our inability to help those situations people to even know who they are that you would Lord supernaturally protect them and change their situation Father change their situation bring to an end some things that were intolerable and to create things Lord that seem impossible we thank you that we can bring this to you Father knowing that you are the God of the impossible You've told us in your word is anything, is anything too hard for you? And the answer is no. And sometimes, Father, the hardest thing that we can overcome is our lack of belief in your ability. Lord, I pray that you would re renew that. You would revive, Lord, our faith. Thank you for what you have done, for what you have been doing, and for what you yet will do. And through this, Father, just like the baking of a cake, when all sorts of individual unpleasant ingredients are mixed together in the right conditions, in the right way, following the instructions, that as your word says, you will bring good out of it. You have not forgotten your people. Lord, call many, many, many to yourself at this time across the whole, the whole world. I ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
God, you are our living hope. Can I thank you for joining us today? Thank you for being with us, and may I wish you God's blessing at this Easter time. And we're going to just conclude with those words of blessing. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, may he establish, strengthen, and settle you in the faith. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you this Easter day and always. Amen. Go in peace in the power of the risen Lord to love and serve him alone. In the name of Christ, to thine be the glory. Amen.